begin today uh, by giving honor and thanks to the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations as the traditional inhabitants of the lands where McMaster stands. To say that is to acknowledge a debt to those who were here before us and to recognize our responsibility as guests to respect and honor the intimate relationship Indigenous people have with this land and to reflect how we each can do more to learn about the rich history of this land so we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. So today's one topic, two disciplines seminar is a special one as it brings together not only the expertise of two researchers from two different disciplines, but the valuable experience from our incredible community partner, Dixon Hall. So Dixon Hall is a multi-service agency focused on addressing poverty, social injustices, and social isolation across the lifespan in Toronto, downtown's Toronto East. In April, 2021, we launched the Mira Dixon Hall Center. This partnership brings together Dixon Hall's experience and expertise in providing comprehensive community-based care and Mira's excellence in creating innovative research programs centered around aging and older adults. Through short and long-term projects that are responsive to the needs of older adults, the center is initially focusing on issues like housing insecurity, various barriers to transportation, transitions in care, such as from the community to hospital and hospital to home, and equitable access to digital technology for older adults. So I'll tell you a little bit about our three speakers. We're really pleased to have them here. The first will be David Raycraft, who is the Director of Housing Services at Dixon Hall. He's served Dixon Hall's diverse community for 15 years to create pathways to appropriate, safe and stable housing. He'll be speaking about the unique challenges faced by seniors who are experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. Next, Michelle Wyndham West is an adjunct faculty member here at McMaster's Department of Health, Aging and Society. She's also a faculty member at OCAD U in Toronto. She'll discuss her work with low income older adults and their experiences of aging, precariousness and housing instability and homelessness in Hamilton. These experiences were collected very, via multimodal arts based touch points, photos, videos and written diaries, as well as interviews and community based participant observation, illustrating how arts based approaches can provide openings for low income older adults to communicate their housing pathway needs and aspirations. And then finally, Courtney Kennedy, who's from the Department of Medicine at McMaster and the Associate Director of the Jarris Center within the Hamilton Health Sciences, will discuss community-based interventions in a clinical context at the transition point from hospital to home for older adults in precarious situations, as well as the community initiatives and interventions that may prevent vulnerable older adults from entering precarious situations. So I'd like to now hand the reins over to David Raycroft, who will speak first. Uh, David, can you share your screen and we'll hold the questions until the end. I most certainly can. Thank you, Audrey. Um, and welcome everyone. Um, as I sort of get set up here, um, let me know if you can hear me, first of all. Thumbs up or, or otherwise. And um, let me just get to the full screen here. There you go. So I'm, as, as um, Audrey said, I'm the Director of Housing Services at Dixon Hall, and I'm going to speak about one particular project today, and that project is um, the work that we've done in partnership with the Seniors Department at Dixon Hall and um, the Senior, and the Department of um, the MAP team from St. Michael's Hospital um, Center for Urban Studies um, at St. Michael's Hospital. So, and for, for the purposes of, of our work with the homeless community, we have defined homelessness um, at, or we've just defined seniors as individuals who are 50 years and older. And that's often because they're individuals who have long histories of, of street homelessness, um, early onset age related illnesses and um, complex mental health and addiction issues, concurrent issues. Um, that that make a, that speed up the rap the aging process, and um, that's particularly evident with the with the homeless community, but other communities as well. Um, we are caught currently. Um, 
homelessness is is, is um, in old age happens for lots of reasons, and many of the individuals that we serve have had long histories of homelessness and have have you know some ten even twenty years of of street homelessness or precarious housing, and um, but commonly cited um, among seniors is is the loss of a spouse or partner, loss of income, um, health related issues. Often um, we hear about individuals who may have had an accident at work. Um, or they're experiencing evictions and um, they end up with us in the shelter system. One of the things that we've experienced over the last um, two years in the course, over the course of the pandemic is that there are ways to do a better job of serving seniors who have find themselves homeless. And, homeless. and that in, in, over the last three years, we've opened up three shelter hotels. We started um, with the Strathcona, moved to Hotel Victoria, and from there, we opened up the Bond Hotel, um, which is located in uh, right at Dundas and Young Street. So many, uh, many of you will have known it. Um, but today, we're going to talk about Hotel Victoria and the issues that arose um, early on in the pandemic. In June 2020, we were asked by the city to um, establish a temporary shelter um, with the capacity of 55 individuals at um, Wellington and Young Street. The little boutique hotel and, um, you know, we were excited about it, but also, you know, wary about, about the realities because we, at this point in the pandemic, we were all struggling to understand what the heck was happening, <laughs> where we were, um, we were going to, how we were going to continue to support the men and women and the communities that we are accustomed to serving. And um, so when we were asked to take on Hotel Victoria, it was much different than the first hotel we took on. With the Strathcona, we had individuals who we knew, individuals who we moved out of the congregate settings in our emergency shelter system, and we supported them um, in transitioning to a hotel, in, in de facto housing, really. We knew that if we handed them keys, that they would be successful in that space and that they would continue to, um, to, to be supported by Dixon Hall. Uh, the community that was intended to move into Hotel Victoria were people who were more precariously street homeless and um, they were young, um, much younger than the populations that we're accustomed to serving. Many of them came from the LGBT community and it was a very chaotic reality for them. As it turns out, they didn't stay for a long time and there were a number of reasons for that, partly because they were unaccustomed to the neighborhood it was just far enough uh, away from the LGBT community that they they felt uncomfortable and they they needed to be close to the services that were offered them more along the um, Church Street corridor. So um, many of them would return. And there was a great deal of pushback from the community in the neighborhood at what they were unhappy with it. And they were all seeing homelessness in a different way as well. They There were not as many people, the people were not coming to work. Um, everything had been shut down. They were seeing homelessness on the streets. There was, um, you know, pushback from the businesses that did stay open. And they just assumed that, that those were the individuals who were living at Hotel Victoria. That was not necessarily the case. So um, in consultation with the city, we decided that we would engage in, in, in a new approach and, and, a new, and work with a new population to fill units as they became available. At that point, we built a relationship with the MAP team um, currently at Hotel Victoria, you'll see um, in 2020, the population was um, much different. There were not as many seniors at that point, um, but over the course of, of the last two years, the population has really dramatically changed and we are about 70% seniors right now. Um, this just demonstrates the seniors population um through in in 2020 um 24 individuals in a, in a site that had capacity to take 55 so there were still grow like by the by december we had more seniors living in that in that space and there were individuals who were being discharged from the emergency shelter system or from the emergency room um or had a relationship with the map team uh the Ur center for urban health at, at saint michael's hospital so as, as I was saying, these complaints um, came around loitering and vandalism. This all happened early on in the pandemic because there were so many people that were had no place to go. They um, 
Tim Hortons was closed for heaven's sakes. People were not the sex clubs where people would frequent and go for respite had closed. Um, all of these spaces that um, the homeless community traditionally found respite were, were closed. Um, so there were homeless people on the streets and people were seeing homelessness in a different way. And, and I think that provided us with an opportunity to build these important relationships with the seniors department at Dixon Hall and to recognize that seniors um, were in this shelter system and had been tragically and um, you know shamefully a big part of the shelter system for a very long time. So this gave us, it gives, provided us with an opportunity to think differently about how we serve homeless people and particularly seniors. It was really difficult um, for us, this transition at this point, um, and, but facilitating direct access to Hotel Victoria provided us um, with a real opportunity to think differently about how these services are provided for seniors. And there were real opportunities here um, in, in, in partnership with the, the um, seniors support team from the navigator team at the MAP um, the MAP program to provide a low barrier transitional space that was safe and stable for seniors, individuals that we were accustomed to serving but and had histories of homelessness. And it really changed the flavor of the community. And, you know, kudos to the work done by um, Elizabeth, who is the supervisor at, at the Victoria Hospital and or Victoria Hospital, I should say Victoria Hotel. And, um, and her team and staff there. It was a much different reality for us as, as we started to work with seniors and um, the population became more stable. And there was a real sense of community that developed over that period of time. Um, the MAP team brought in about 46 clients and they came from between October, 2020 and February, 2022, um, which is really, and we continue to work very closely with them. 31 um, of those individuals were 50 plus, and others were um, people who were convalescing, um, dealing with serious primary health issues and the challenges that often are faced by homeless people. And are, often those people were discharged directly to street homelessness, and that continues to be a problem in our system. And, and I think what we've seen at Hotel Victoria is that we have a real opportunity to change the way we think about sheltering individuals and and how they they come to the shelter system and how we support them in um, getting the services they need and that we build systems similar to Hotel Victoria and that we move away from the, the determination that this is a temporary hotel, a temporary response to homelessness in the city and that we, we make these kinds of responses permanent and that we build effective strategies to support seniors because it really continues to be a real travesty that there are so many seniors living in the shelter system. Um, and you can see here, I think um, that currently 71% of ind individuals living at Hotel Victoria are in 2021 are um, seniors 50 plus and or, and or individuals living. And they and this is actually seniors, but there are a lot of people who are not seniors who are convalescing as well, people living with concurrent disorders, mental health and addictions. So the pop, the, that percentage is much, much higher in fact. And that that has stabilized since um, um, May, you know, or like through 2022, we're a pretty stable population at about 70% of, of, of individuals that are um, that are living with us that are seniors. These are just um, da data showing that that um, that population is consistently has consistently grown over the last two years and um, and continues to grow as we think about um, developing new systems that respond to the needs of, of these men and women. Strathcona and um, the Bond Place Hotel are two other hotels where we operate. Um, we have 90 folks who are living at Strathcona. It is a hotel with 200 people and we share that space with other, um, another service provider, Homes First Society. Currently, um, they have about 110 individuals and we have about 90 individuals living there. 
I think the interesting thing about Strathcona is that that population is as well um, a seniors population. Um, they represent about 60% of the population um, at that, the 60 individuals are um, at that pop in that um, space that are seniors. And it is not, it's a different seniors population. Again, they're seniors that we've known and we've supported for a long time through the Out of the Cold program, which is a, a was a program that operated by Dixon Hall and through our emergency shelter system, individuals who are um, more stable, not dealing with the same um, issues around um, health issues and those challenges. So um, it's a much more stable space than the um, the Victorious um, building. And we have um, we do have some support from MAP, and we do support individuals to move into Strathcona. But the turnover at Strathcona is not not as graded as it has been at Hotel Victoria. And um, the Bond Hotel, you'll see the population is significant small. The, the seniors population is significantly smaller. Um, the population generally at the Bond Place Hotel, um, where there are 250 individuals, are much their needs are much more complex and they're not seniors um, in the same, to the same degree as they are in our other programs. I think, um, you know, some of the things that we often think about when we're talking about, um, about homelessness and particularly with seniors is that we have a, um, a very unique opportunity with the creation of the Bond Hotel and understanding that that this provides people with an opportunity to have their own bathroom, um, something that seniors, you know, need and and benefit from. Um, there's privacy that they, they they didn't have in the congregate setting, and there are opportunities for us to continue to to apply the housing first principles. Um, it's not in opposition to housing first because it, but except that it in, it is in fact a temporary site. So what the future of that space looks like, we're not sure. And as we as we begin to think about the decommissioning of these shelter hotel programs, I think it's important that we begin to compile the data and make it and make it clear to the city that that what we need is a seniors' response to housing and, and street homelessness and um, something similar to the program at um, at Victoria would be really vital and important for us as we move forward. Um, thanks everyone. That's, that's about it. I'm happy to take questions now, or do you want to hold questions till later on? Audrey, it's up to you. Um, let's hold them till later and, and, okay. and we can have a good uh, discussion around the questions. That Great. Uh, so the next speaker will be um, Michelle Wyndham West and Michelle, if you can share your slides, that would be wonderful. Great, thank you very much. And it was really great to hear about the work that you're doing, David. I would love to chat later more about that. Um, so can everyone hear me okay? Perfect, great. Well, I'm Michelle Wyndham West and I have a few appointments at uh, McMaster, but I also work at um, OCAD University. Sorry, my slides aren't changing. I've got to figure this out here. Sorry for the moment here. I'm just going to, to stop share and then let's see if I can get them to move. Sorry, I'll have to reload. Sorry about that. No problem. Take your time. Oh, these seem to be working, which is good. So sorry, sorry about the technical difficulties. They, they seem to plague me most of the time. So thank you for having me uh, today. It's a pleasure to talk about this research, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion at the end. So I'll get straight to it. Um, so I've divided up the presentation in terms of the challenge, the methods that um, we have used, and then some of the results and then the research going forward. So the challenge that we're facing is the number of older adults in Canada is estimated to grow to more than 9.5 million by 2030, comprising 23% of the total Canadian population. As a result of this growth and other challenges in the aging care system in Canada, housing instability and experiences of low-income older adults and their effects on successful aging will be crucial in the coming decades. Rapid urban change or gentrification in Hamilton, a mid-sized Canadian city, which has a population of 550,000 in the province of Ontario, 
has resulted in increasing involuntary or incentivized mobility and displacement among low-income older adults renting in the private sector. Thus, housing instability and homelessness is, as you've heard with David, is an increasing concern amongst low-income older adults. So I wanted to start by defining precarious, precarity and precariousness and how that is framed in the research, because it really does drive a lot of what we're doing. So precariousness refers to the embodied everyday experiences of being a member of the precariat or those subject to precarity. Therefore, precarity, the parameters through which economic security and social support are threatened, sets the conditions through which precariousness is negotiated on a quotidian or a daily basis. So a lot of this research is really looking at the strategies that low-income older adults invoke on a daily basis when they are dealing with this constant set uh, feeling of being precarious. So precariousness within aging and housing includes involuntary or incentivized housing displacement, health discounting in the face of high or rising shelter costs, inappropriate housing, which can include inappropriate housing in terms of physical and cognitive functioning, periods of homelessness, involuntary housing immobility, when low income older adults are unable to move to more appropriate accommodations due to rising costs. And the framework through which I approach this research, I'm technically trained as a medical anthropologist, but I do work at OCAD and I practice what is called design anthropology. So design anthropology is defined as ethnographically informed designs of new products, services, and systems for consumers and businesses. So ethnography is the process of embedding yourself within a particular context, spending a lot of time speaking to a lot of people, observing, using the different methods, which I'll describe in a few minutes, to really understand the best that one can uh, the situation from the perspective of those who are experiencing that particular context. So design anthropology encourages impact, applied public and engaged scholarship, which addresses social inequalities, disadvantage and marginalization. So the particular brand of or, or, or approach that I have to design anthropology is something that I've developed over the last couple of years, which is a combination of uh, many years of, of doing community-based research and then uh, getting an appointment at OCAD, which is a very design-oriented environment. So I, I've coined this inclusive design for health. So this is the particular approach that I use. And you may, uh, might ask, how is inclusive design for health practiced? Well, there's definitely a diversity in topics and approaches, but however, all approaches are conducted through co-design. So what does co-design mean within health contexts? There's, there are four tenets that I basically live by when I, when, I, when I design a research project, I carry out the research project, and then I analyze the results. So the first one is decolonization. So this involves a redistribution of power in the research relationship and the research project, whereby lived experiences lead the research processes. And I'll explain more examples of this as I talk about the research in the coming slides. So this is a process of redefining what counts as knowledge or evidence in the research process. And I also try to bring a frame of criticality to, to the research all along the way. And this is really a critical lens, um, or you can use a theoretical framework, but it's really just reflecting critically all throughout the research process to avoid reproducing existing power structures and design outputs. So in order to do this throughout the research process, I will consistently ask overarching questions like, how is power formulated and distributed across systems? How do users travel? So these, in this sense, the users would be the participants. So how do users travel or find it difficult to travel through these systems? And what type of disruption is needed to make these improved and inclusive journeys? The other tenet I try to embrace and be reflective about is uncertainty. Co-design is not a linear process as, as all of you who practice it know. And there is generally always throughout the, the um, research journey, a sense of uncertainty because you're not the one who has the necessarily has the knowledge or the evidence. And so you shouldn't be leading and shaping all of the processes. So, but uncertainty does have a positive side to it. It brings possibility, and you need to get comfortable with taking risks. And as I always say to my students, 
we need to learn how to surf through the uncertainty. And then the fourth tenant is creativity. So creativity and processes, learning together through accessible making. It's really important that the arts-based approaches are tailored to the particular participant group that you're working with so that they can take part in it. And what I found through doing this research is that arts-based approaches create new spaces for lived experience communication, particularly in trauma-informed experiences. So now I'll go over the research project as it has been staged. Because this is a co-design project, it, it takes quite a few years to, to uh, carry out. So the first stage is complete, and I'll be speaking mostly about this stage today. Um, so the first stage was an ethnographic study in Hamilton using digital art space techniques to understand the housing instability and homelessness experiences of low-income older adults. And this led us to understand that there's a gap between social housing and low-income rentals and long-term care. So more low-income older adults could age in community with the right housing and supports. And the second stage, which is currently underway, involves mapping the connections between housing, supports, and aging in community for low-income older adults by co-designing journey maps which chart current housing and support pathways, and journey maps which outline their future aspirations for housing and support pathways, including, including housing, transit, and local amenities for themselves and their families. And in stage two, we will consider how these data can be best designed and visualized to inform policymaking. So as this is a multi-year project, and we, as happens in co-design generally, the first stage, we go very wide. So it's a very broad inquiry to understand what people need. And then once we have a better sense of what people need, stage two is more fine-tuned and the research is more focused on delivering what the participants need in that particular context. So in stage one, we use digital arts-based techniques to understand the housing experiences uh, of the participants. Participants were given digital tablets to record their photos, videos, and written diaries. And this included their experiences of housing instability and homelessness. And in doing so, participants decided what to document and when. So this is an attempt in changing the research dynamic. It doesn't entirely change the power relations that are inherent in academic research, but it's an attempt to allow participants in the first phase, the open phase of the co-design, to help set the agenda, so to speak. And we also found that open approach to arts-based outputs allows the priorities of the older adults to surface, but it also provides an alternate form of communication for trauma-informed experiences, which can be very difficult to express verbally through a one-on-one -on -one interview. We also had individual semi-structured interviews with participants and participant observation in community-based settings when that was possible. This particular stage of the research started before the pandemic, ended up carrying out through the pandemic. So I wasn't always able to, but when it was safe to, I did see participants. So data collection points focused upon capturing participant touch points in their housing journeys. And the Hamilton-based participants lived in rent to gear to income housing, private market rentals, and if you had been homeless uh, for the first time as older adults, which we are seeing increasingly. So now I'll go into the part, two of the participants' stories. Unfortunately, I can't go into them all, but I thought that these two were representative, and I wanted to show you a few of the photographs that participants took as well. So this is a participant photograph of the library in downtown Hamilton. If you're from Hamilton, you may be familiar with this particular spot. And this is a, an older gentleman perusing the stacks. The library, as you may know, if you do this type of research, is a really important community hub for low-income older adults. Not only is it a place where they can meet and make social connections, they can get access to the computers and they take part in programming. And on really hot summer days, like we've been experiencing here in Hamilton, there's usually air conditioning. Unfortunately, these were suspended somewhat during the pandemic, but this photograph it was taken to show an important place for the participants. And I'll go into a little bit of detail with two participant stories. And the first one is George. He, when, I, uh, when he took part in this, this study, he was a 72-year-old Indigenous man, and he had experienced rent eviction. He had couch surfed and was homeless for a period of time before finding a spot in social housing. He described his housing experience as a house of cards, so it was always precarious. 
While taking part in the research, George had been photographing the neighborhood he was born into, grew up in, worked as an adult, and was now aging in, all within a 20 block radius in downtown Hamilton. So it was really interesting about this series of photographs that George took was that his narrative was actually one of continuity within continuity of place within this 20 block radius, as opposed to a, a, a narrative that one would expect of someone who had experienced so much instability. Um, George was also forever the optimist. He actually found a spot in social housing uh, throughout this when he was taking part in the study. So when I first met him at the library, he was indeed homeless, but he got a spot and he was waiting for that spot while he was taking part in the study. So in his diary, so he kept a diary when he took the photographs as well, he wrote, when it's time to make a change, the universe will make it so uncomfortable for you that you have no choice but to leave. So one of his photographs follows. This is a, a photograph of a social housing building in downtown Hamilton under construction. So George received notice that he got a spot in this building while we were taking part in the project. And he took photographs of the building as it was being built. So he liked to document his progression because he was very excited for his upcoming home. And the next participant I'll talk about was Deborah. She was another example of housing precariousness with a life trajectory that included surviving an abusive ex-husband and entering the workforce after divorce. She credits her strong Christian faith and relationship with God for helping her through the turmoil she experiences in her life. And because of this understood a greater plan was at work through her faithfulness. So in her project provided tablet, she took a series of photographs which featured Pinterest pins of what, of what one could describe as a rustic or countryside inspired homes and interior design. There were a lot of photos of, of aspirational homes on her tablet. And as I mentioned, I've written here on the slide, these photographs can be understood as aspirational. So despite Deborah's ho housing pathway, she went from owning her own home to renting in the private sector and having great difficulty holding on to that rental and needing a lot of repairs and experiencing a rent eviction to living in social housing. And these photographs illustrate the kind of home she would like to live in and the hopefulness she has for creating a different housing future for herself. So here's an example of one of the photographs that she downloaded to her tablet. So this is a, looks like sort of like an English countryside cottage, I would say. So as we were taking part in this research, we noticed that there was a sense of hope and a strong desire to envision a future when participants took part in arts-based activities, despite the difficult circumstances of aging while being homeless or experiencing housing instability. And for participants to engage in future-making is a form of resilience. There aren't specific formulas for change-making within uncertainty, but ways of thinking about how uncertainty can be transformative to create new ways of understanding and imagining the world. So we like to call this moving beyond. And so most of the participants took part in moving beyond through the, the uh, arts-based materials that they produced. And moving beyond is a willingness to imagine a future that is beyond our tangible knowing and feeling. And these are possibilities that are open concepts leading to many starting points. We also noticed a link between the arts-based approaches, future-making and material agency. And I'll define material agency and explain a little bit about what we discovered with that. So material agency is the process through which tactile and emotional interaction with material objects, including the art that we create or the photographs, the videos and the diaries that participants created on their tablets has the productive capacity to both form memory and spur actions in the future. So material agency is both a process and a product. So the process of creating with material objects, including the outputs that the participants created and the effects that the creative objects or products we have create can have in the world. So what I mean is by that, and I hope this makes sense, I'm still working my way through this and I'm writing an article about this, is there was an agentive process for the participants to create these particular um, records of, of their experiences, but also now we can take these products, the, these um, photographs, et cetera, and we can bring them out into the world and we can use those to communicate their experiences to hopefully affect some type of change. 
So in weaving the participant narratives and tablet photographs, diary entries and screenshots together, we understand them to be the process and product of material agency, and they have the ability to allow, afford, encourage, permit, suggest, influence, block and render possible. And what these particular uh, records that the participants have left us with um, allows us to provide compelling examples of what is sometimes called altered forms of aging. And so altered forms of aging are a different narrative than the dominant narrative of aging that older adults will be taken care of by the state or by their private or familiar savings. So what we're finding is there's a different narrative out there about aging and precarity. Um, yes. And so by recounting altered forms of aging, we're attempting to bring recognizability to the experiences of aging, precariousness and in housing, including homelessness of the participants. So this record reveals complex housing trajectories, including rent evictions, homelessness, and the bureaucratic difficulties associated with securing a spot in rent geared to income housing. So participants' experiences also highlight the possibility of a hopeful future, despite the gravity of their experiences. So I just want to end with the second stage of the research that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, we're in the process of doing this right now, spending most of the summer in the field. And so the second stage, the goal is to co-design equitable housing and support pathways for participants in Hamilton. So in this stage, I'm in the process of doing a very lengthy one-on-one -on -one interviews with a, a little more of a holistic approach to aging in community. So housing and the supports that they need from medical to community-based to transportation to social supports. And with that information, we're in the process of co-designing, uh, sorry, of determining co-design sessions, which will take place in August with the participants. And so in these co-design sessions, we're going to map out their current journeys. So what needs are currently not being met. And then this, in the second co-design session in August with the participants, we're going to map out their future aspirations for housing and supports, including transit and local amenities. And we're hoping again that these arts-based activities will create a, a unique space for looking forward and imagining new futures. And it's also important to, to mention though that these journey maps actually are systems design solutions as well. And so in the fall, we'll also be taking these journey maps to providers and policymakers in Hamilton and asking them what is possible uh, in terms of what the participants uh, need and envision for the future. And one of the big questions that we're also facing in this particular phase of the research is how do we scale solutions? So after the co-design of options, as I mentioned, we'll consult and we also need to render these, these potential solutions in a way that has that are visually uh, arresting and uh, will be able to inform future policymaking to keep people's interest. So as you know, community-based research takes a village to, to uh, carry out. So I wanted to thank a few organizations for their support over the years. So the Collaboratory for Research on Urban Neighborhoods, Community Health and Housing, Crunch and McMaster. And I also, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention at the beginning, I do, I, I do this research with uh, Jim Dunn, who is with the Health, Health, Aging and Society Department at McMaster, and he runs Crunch. And he also runs the Canadian Housing Evidence Collaborative, Czech and McMaster. And also I've had uh, great support from the School of Graduate Studies at OCAD. And the second phase of this study is being funded through a Catalyst grant by the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging, which is Mira. And my last slide is my contact details, and I'd be happy to take any questions at the end of the uh, session and also in future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle. That was wonderful. And um, we have our final speaker, Courtney Kennedy, uh, who uh, will share her, share her slides now. Great, thank you, Audrey. Just give me one minute to do that. The techie stuff here. Okay, you can hear me okay? Okay, very yep, good. And we can see. Yeah, I'm gonna run, here we go. There we go, okay. Perfect. All right, um, so those were great presentations, very interesting. Um, so, and I, I loved, um, some of the pictures, Michelle, and, and the, the wisdom and hopefulness that they, they can contain. So 
Very nice. Um, so following up on some of that, I think it's a good fit. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking more a little bit about frailty and precarity and some mitigating strategies. So first, I should probably position myself a little bit. So um, I mean, I have been a longstanding, I guess, frailty researcher and epidemiologist, but I'm now also I'm working on the ground, so to speak, um, in a clinical role with the, really the, one of the highest risk segments of our healthcare system. So mainly older adults who are high system users with multiple comorbidities and, and often uh, facing social determinants of health. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit on the strategies section. Um, but first, um, I think, so today I want to just go through some of the key frailty concepts that are relevant. Um, and then I would like to try to merge that concept of precarity and frailty, which is a little newer for me, um, but for the context of this talk. Um, and then I'd like to talk, like I said, about some of the solutions. So first I would just like to talk a little about, a little bit about the concept of what are some of the known contributors to optimal aging. This is something I've often presented. Um, and I don't have genetics on here, so these are just modifiable ones. Um, so I think at this point, I mean, in terms of optimal aging, we have a pretty good idea of what the successful components are. Uh, so these are really some of the big six. So an avoidance of risk factors like smoking, substance use, regular health screening is of course important. Uh, social engagement as highlighted by David, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's becoming increasingly recognized as important. Um, and then of course, you know, physical activity, cognitive stimulation um, and optimal nutrition. So if we were to maximize these on our own continuum, we're all in agreement. I think that these are pretty beneficial factors. The, actually carrying them out is, is something else. Um, sorry. So, uh, but now I'd like to also just move on to talking about some key frailty concepts. Um, so at the other end of the spectrum, um, frailty not being an optimal state. So the first is that, I mean, really a key concept is that frailty ex does exist on a continuum of fitness to frailty, right? So it's, it's not a static state or an all or none kind of state. Um, and it's also not synonymous with age. So here's this continuum I was talking about, sorry. Um, so if you consider that these women are all the same age, obviously, um, there's some real genetics at play down there on the left-hand side, um, but it's, it's clearly not um, just, really just synonymous with age. So on this next slide, um, this is just some data to sort of back that up. This is something we did in a large study, the Canadian osteoporosis study with almost 10,000 people looking at frailty across the lifespan. Um, and I just put this up just to kind of exemplify um, clearly these are box plots that show the distribution of frailty in each in each decade. Um, but so yeah, so as we get older in the 70s, whoops, um, I got a phone call coming in. Sorry, once <laughs> let me just mute that. Um, so in yeah, so so but one of the things I want to illustrate about this is that it does occur in the middle ages too, right? So it's um, it's something that does come on, and so it's not that it's non-existent. Um, and this next slide here is something, I love this because this is some recent work um, led by Lauren Griffiths at McMaster um, with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And what it shows is that um, they found that, you know, higher frailty and study participants who were, who did have low income, did not complete secondary education and had low perceived social standing. And what's really interesting is that the average frailty level for those from 45 to 54 in the lowest income group um, was greater than that of 75 to 85 year olds in higher income groups. So just moving on a little here. So another you know, concept about frailty that I really like this one is that it's a, a transition phase between successful aging and disability and conditioned to target for restoring robustness in the individual at risk. So this meaning, of course, that, you know, it's not a static thing. This is something that we can do something about. We can build resilience and we can improve these states. 
and just briefly, I'm not going to get into this too much, but I mean, different conceptualizations of frailty. I mean, there's physical frailty. That's often what we think of um, when we think frailty. So, you know, slow walking speed, low energy, weakness, low activity levels and weight loss. Um, that's a very common one. And then a, I think multidimensional frailty is a complementary concept, um, expanding it out to include some of the other um, don't health domains. So this is one that I typically, the work that I've done, we've done a frailty index, um, which looks at all those different multidimensional domains. So, so, I mean, I've worked a lot with also with Dr. Ken Rockwood, who um, is the pioneer of the frailty index um, approach. So this one I also just like, because I think it's very illustrative again, is that um, the more things that people have wrong with them, the higher the likelihood of frailty. So I think that picture just says it all as things are accumulating. Um, this is, it leads to some of the, the adverse consequences and health states that we're gonna talk about more here. So this, I mean, I think we all know consequences of frailty, right? Um, a whole, it could be a whole host of things. Um, certainly recurrent hospital admissions can lead to institutionalization. Um, loss of independence, right, is a huge one for people. Um, and having to often to move from alternate living into, you know, long-term care or other situations. Um, and also, I think um, falls is a big one. That's something I'm really interested in as well. So um, just one other point before moving on here is that, you know, another concept is that frailty involves um, multiple systems, okay? So it's not just that it's, you know, any one chronic disease it can a chronic disease can accelerate it but it emerges independent of just one or two right and that it's um cumulative declines across multiple systems so as i mentioned before i think it's it's a key concept that you know it's something that it's it's dynamic and modifiable and this is just this is the researcher me putting some of these graphs and numbers up but uh, just to prove that i'm still a researcher <laughs> um that this this was one um, that was done actually in, in a Spanish study that um, they were able to, to track things over longitudinal, longitudinally and showed that um, in red there, you, know, you can see that um, there are a number of individuals that went from frailty back to pre-frailty and people went from pre-frailty to, to being non-frail again. So um, this is this definition here is if I think if you were to read an academic article, this is generally the definition of frailty. Most of them start with this, that frailty is a state of decreased reserves resulting in increased vulnerability to adverse outcomes when exposed to stressors. So I have always thought that was a bit of a mouthful. I'm, I'm not sure that I necessarily understood that the first time. Uh, so I'm just gonna just, I sometimes like to break it down a little bit is what do we even meet, mean by like, what is physiological reserve? And I just love this little graph because it's like, really it's bounce back capability. Um, so I think that illustrates the concept very clearly. Um, I always have that in my mind when I think of that now. Um, and this next one here is just, so what we need, mean by increased vulnerability is that, so if we think, the green line. So if somebody is managing well, not frail, um, and they get have a minor illness or some stressor is put upon them, let's say it's COVID-19, um, you know, they're going to lose some function, but then they have that ability, that reserve to bounce back to baseline. So that the green line, it's, it's straight, right? If we go to the next one, the orange one, so if you have mild frailty, um, if you have, once again, let's say somebody gets COVID-19, they, they're gonna they're gonna struggle for a bit. They're gonna they've lost some function, and they they are able to bounce back, but maybe not quite to that same level. But they're still in that range of of independence. And then somebody so this at the bottom here in the red line, somebody with severe frailty, they get COVID nineteen now, and um, they've now just they've lost so much uh, function and a host of things going on that they've dipped sort of into this. Uh, they've reached that frailty tipping point. They've gone over and now they're not going to be able to come back into that independent state. So I think I really like this graph just to illustrate that concept. Um, so then that final point too about what are some of the stressors and accelerators. Um, 
this just points out so um, a loss of physiological reserve that bounce back capability it is part of the normal aging process um, beginning in our 30s i think we noticed that there's a decline in all of these processes um, so that's normal it's about 1.5 percent per year in individual organ function um, however there we can accelerate that and that's where we get into you know getting into frailer states so chronic diseases can accelerate it multiple acute stressors as we just were talking about sometimes illnesses could be even medication side effects lifestyle and nutrition factors of course environmental and social determinants and social isolation so all of these things are things that can we can accelerate it and there are things that obviously then we need to target um on this next i just um on that final point, and this is some of the stuff I think David was talking about too, you know, with Dixon Hall about socially isolated seniors. Um, I mean, of course, they get they get frailer faster. And this graph, um, epidemiologically, uh, they proved in you know in almost ten thousand people that even after adjusting, taking out of the equation gender, marital status, ethnicity, education, smoking status, and even wealth that those who were socially isolated um, definitely were becoming more frail. So now I'm gonna take a quick stab um, at um, just merging those concepts. Um, so frailty and precarity. Um, I am I mean, not a social scientist or I'm not a you know, gerontologist. I had to sort of look up the concept of precarity, um, you know, as Michelle very nicely have, has already set the stage for me on this, but to me it was just, okay, so it's lacking in predictability, security, material or psychological welfare. Um, so I was sort of thinking about this as I was preparing for this talk about what are the precarious factors that I'm seeing every day with older adults that I work with. Um, Oh, sorry, I forgot to switch slide here. Um, so, and I, so really, it was easy. To, it was very quick. The funds that come to mind um, are, I mean, we, as we've been talking about, adequate housing, food security, um, income security, even sometimes maximizing government entitlements. It's amazing the number of people that haven't always even applied for things or don't have the right have a health card, have that access to do that. Um, community mobility. So if you don't have access to getting out, how do you get to your appointments? Um, and really someone in your corner. I think that the, one of the things I've been most amazed about is the people who don't have people are just, there's lots of them and how much higher risk that puts you. So I think if we don't address these factors first, really that's that foundation. Um, so that's the precarity to me that the house can crumble. And it's really that simple if we don't address that um we can't get to these other factors that i talked about i mean the the um you know these key pieces to frailty management and optimal aging um so i mean often with more affluent older adults too we're especially the ones who sign up for research studies this is what we're focused on and this is what we're managing um but if we want to have health equity and really prevent frailty across society and all age cohorts, we need to prevent precarity. So this is sort of my new lens of thinking about that to have optimal aging for all. So just moving on now um, to some solutions. Um, I This is just in a nutshell, um, you know, I won't go through all of these, but the first one, I mean, informed practitioners is key, um, you know, not just researchers, but on the ground people understanding some of the ways that we can mitigate this and of course policymakers as well. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about frailty management um, and some initiatives that I've been involved in that's uh, more from you know a medical standpoint managing it. Uh, and then at the top there, this is the program actually that I currently work for, hospital to home, and I'll look a little bit about how talk a bit about that, how emerging health and social factors. Um, and then move on to talk briefly about the emboldened study, so a community intervention. So in terms of frailty management, um, I don't want to take too much time on this, but this is just that we did a huge, um, led by Dr. Ahmed Negam, um, a systematic or a network meta-analysis to really look at what are the things that um, work for man managing frailty. Um, so one of the limitations, though, is really it was focused on um, only certain things, so not necessarily things like social isolation, 
Um, at the end of the day, really it came out that physical activity plus nutritional supplementation are probably the most effective interventions to reduce frailty. So um, right now there is um, a big study that was funded by CHR led by Dr. Alexandra Papuano, who's the executive, executive director of JERIS and a professor of course at McMaster and a geriatrician. Um, so she is leading this work um, in a big RCT now to really test out these key components that we've already, I've already just gone through, um, putting that into a study and looking to see how, what, what are, how that improves frailty and a host of other outcomes. Um, one of the interesting things about this trial is that we're going to compare, um, three, it's a three-arm trial, so control group versus just the exercise versus that Cadillac arm of putting some of those other components in and see, see what happens. Um, it is actually in recruitment now, and it's being carried out in partnership with the YMCA sites here in Hamilton um, and also in Brantford and Waterdown. So that is, will be ongoing for a couple of years. The next thing I just wanted to touch base here on um, was just, yeah, as I mentioned, so I've been working for the hospital to home team at Hamilton Health Sciences um, as a coordinator. So this, this is a team that was established in 2014, a very innovative program um, that was, is really targeting um, older adults that have five or more hospital admissions, so ED or hospitalization, or in four or more chronic conditions. So they are referred to our team and then we go and, and you know, see them in the community. So as they pass the baton from hospital to home and have more continuity. And we do actually work with, with homeless individuals as well. So home, home is anywhere, right? So, um, so just briefly, this team here. Um, so it's, what's innovative, I think, is that it's combining embedding um, community health navigators who are helping with the social needs um, with the health professionals who are looking after the health needs. And we, they, we're literally in the same office, we see the same patients and work in coordination. Um, so the health professionals do the health assessments and we develop coordinated care plans. Um, and the, the community health navigators are focused on facilitating um, that foundation, those pieces of you know, food, income and housing security and helping often with system navigation, setting up appointments, helping people get health cards, that sort of thing. So I could, I could go on all day, but I better get moving here. Um, I, don't know, I haven't used too much time, I hope, Audrey. I'm, all, I'm getting near the end. Um, so just coming back to, yeah, this, this diagram that was new for me for this talk is, is that we've at the top, we've got the health stuff and at the bottom, um, the social pieces in addressing frailty and precarity that way. So um, before I leave off, so I'm just going, I'm going to go through briefly the Embolden study. Um, which is a community. So the other stuff I was talking about really much more focused on individuals. Um, the Embolden study is a community intervention. Um, so this is partnering with older adults and communities to develop and test a novel approach to enhance physical and community mobility in older adults. So this, um, you know, it's, we're an interdisciplinary team. This is led by Dr. Rebecca Ganan, um, who's in the School of Nursing and really um, all kinds of disciplines here and community research partners because Michelle again set up the co-design principle very nicely but much better than I could um, so that we've been working in partnership um, with these, these research partners in the strategic guiding council. So, so a little bit of background on Embolden. Um, I mean, really it's on the premise that, you know, improving mobility is so critical to health and quality of life. Um, so, but little research has really explored that um, and how we can appropriately target community-based programs. Um, and also we want to be able to build on, I mean, you can't, you need to build on existing community health and social services, which is necessary for real world impact. So that, that is really what Embolden is, is setting out to do. So the goals are to promote physical and community mobility of older adults who may experience difficulties participating in community programs and live in areas uh, with limited resources to promote optimal health. Um, so we are targeting communities specifically like Dixon Hall and Five and Hamilton um, that are areas um, of, of high needs and low income areas. So 
um, to partner with older, older adults and service providers is also a key goal of Embolden. So our study questions, I mean, the one, um, the clinical or the, the individual one is, does, does the three month Embolden intervention increase physical mobility compared to usual care in, in older adults residing in areas of high health inequity? And we're measuring that the primary outcome is measuring mobility using accelerometers and see if there's a change in sedentary and physical behavior. Um, and then also at the other level is, is how is the emboldened intervention implemented and adapted across diverse neighborhoods and how, how can we do that better and is it feasible? So these are the key, the core program features. These are all in the same theme that I've been talking about this whole presentation it's targeting physical activity, healthy eating, building social connections um, and not missing out on that piece, that social, that system navigation piece. Um, I won't get into it too much here, but just this will be delivered, the intervention itself will be delivered um, as 12 weekly group sessions. So in small cohorts, 10 to 15 adults, plus some individually tailored system navigation pieces. Um, and this, that enables, um, you know, that I mean, some of that is these cohort building things, that's that social connection piece as well, in addition to just targeting education and behavior change. Um, so I just will briefly say that, that as Michelle mentioned about co-design, this, the whole study has been um, in partnership with a strategic guiding council um, to adapt so that we can adapt best to community needs and build on existing strengths. It is currently um, in phase two, which is exciting. So phase one has been completed with an environmental scan, doing some very thorough evidence reviews that are now, um, I think two of them are published um, about what were the, are the key pieces to that interventional piece and how can we best deliver them. Um, and the co-design has been thoroughly explored as well. Um, so yeah, so now, now it's time to implement. Um, so all these studies are in the, in the works, but in a couple of years, it'll be very interesting to see um, the results. So I think that's it. Um, I know I've used a lot of time just leaving again with um, that, you know, how can we mitigate precarity and frailty is to address both health factors and social factors. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney, and, and to all of our speakers. That was really wonderful and, and really complimentary. Um, so I want to open it up for questions um, from our audience and, and um, as well to our speakers if they may have questions or comments for each other. Uh, you can type them in the bottom or you can raise your hand and I'll sort of call on you as you appear in order at the top. <clears throat> Maybe as people gather their thoughts, I have a, a first question for, um, for Dr. Michelle Wyndham West. So um, you, these stories that you shared with us and the, the, um, um, the board, the journey maps and, and things like that, I found them very engaging and really easy to sort of identify with the, the um, challenges and, and, and the experiences of the people that you interviewed. How do you find um, it, if there are other differences in communicating these findings to different types of groups? For, you talked about communicating with policymakers at the end. Um, I also wonder about other academics and the public. Sometimes people have come to expect data in a, um, in a sort of numeric sense. It, so I, I wonder if these different groups maybe respond more positively or, or with you know, difficulty sort of appreciating the, um, what you're telling them. That's a really good question. Um, I find that if one can relay the stories in a compelling way, they really do hit, hit people. And it's a way of understanding um, people's experiences that numbers don't deliver. But, but to affect change, you need both. You need the qualitative and the quant. You do, you do need to, to give policymakers a sense of the lay of the land, what the numbers are, how severe the crisis is, because we are seeing, as David mentioned, homelessness amongst um, older adults for the first time as seniors is on the rise. And this will only get worse as, as the uh, aging population goes forward, right? And, and increases in size. So this is a great beginning. I have visions of an even larger project going forward and uh, marrying it with the quant uh, in order to affect change as well. But the visualizations are really important um, in terms of the communication. And I think that's where design helps. I hope I answered your question. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I just I see one question in the chat there about uh, sharing the slides. I think what we'll do is we'll uh, circle back to our presenters and um, ask if there is a version that is shareable just to make sure there's nothing in there that uh, we might want to remove for confidentiality and and um, and see if we can share that back with people after the um, presentations are over. Um, I see a question here uh, from Masuma. Uh, so much great information here about housing issues. Um, how do we whole design? That seems to be less defined, but an important issue in the literature. Anybody want to tackle that one? Or maybe each of you. Can I pick on, yeah, David, I was going to see, maybe you might have some insight there. Yeah, I think one of the things that we've discovered um, in, in the Victoria project is that um, people really feel like they're part of a community. And, and, and I guess it's most challenging to think about that from the context of people who have been street homeless for a very long time or living in only in congregate settings. The, the pride that they have when you provide them with a room and an opportunity to close the door behind them. They have you know, bathroom facilities that are their own. Those are just very simple things to think about, but, uh, and very simple things that the rest of us take for granted. I also think that the, um, the other important thing to think about is, is um, toileting. You know, they, they feel um, like respected in ways that, that they haven't in a very long time and um, an opportunity for people to meet and, and, and come together. I think that, you know, congregate, one of the challenges that we have at the Hotel Victoria is that we don't have enough common space, spaces for people to meet. I think that's an important to think, thing to think about when we're thinking about designing spaces for seniors. Can I also just, actually one of the questions that I had, so that's, that's a great question that Masuma had, and it's one that I actually had as well, sort of for David, um, is, you know, I'm just noticing that sometimes, yeah, it's very tricky, the mobility aspect, you know, in shelters, you know, if there's stairs, they're having to go down. I mean, so with, with seniors specifically, um, you know, or people with mobility limitations, how it's pretty tricky. And um, I think Hamilton as well, newer has had, had some hotels open, with, so the advent of the elevator has, has, is helpful to that group. Um, but yeah, if you just have any other comments, I guess, David, about, um, yeah, like better, how to better meet needs for seniors in that. And also, um, like, I don't know if you have any experience with, I think you mentioned a little bit about like transitional care beds. So like, you know, being able to, to provide some, um, some of the medical care needs too for frail seniors. Yeah, I mean, we have, we've been lucky enough for most of the, the time that the project has been open to be working with, uh, as I've said, the MAP team, but also the inner city health associate. So there have been medical supports on site. Those are things that, that um, we've, we've longed for for a very long time and been asking for for a very long time. How we maintain them moving forward is really important. Mobility issues, accessibility, all of those things are, are really important to think about. Um, we have one very slow moving elevator in that building. It's a very old building. Um, and, you know, we were actually without um, that for almost a month. And it was really frustrating for, for everyone um, and really difficult on the staff to like climbing eight flights of stairs every day. So those things are really um, important whenever we're thinking about designing space for, for people who have, um, who are seniors, period. I think there's a whole bunch, there, there are ways that we can redefine accessibility and begin to think about um, visual aids, um, making sure that, that for, for people who are where there are literacy issues, um, all of those kinds of things that, that can be um, incorporated into the design of any, any project moving forward. Can I just add briefly to that? It's a, it's a good question and it's nice to see you today, Masuma. Um, she's an OCAD student. Um, the, the individuals that I'm currently interviewing, I just spent the whole day in the field on Friday, are still out in the community. And one of the things that they imparted to me was the variability 
in aging, how, you know, being 70 to 75 or 80 to 85 doesn't mean the same thing for everyone, right? So there, there needs to be an aspect of customability, depends on one's overall health, comorbidities, all of that kind of stuff. But they did mention for the individuals who aren't living in social housing and are living in market rentals is the access to common spaces is really important and something that they would like to see more of because there are definitely common spaces in social housing and also slightly bigger kitchens so they can cook so that they, their, um, their nutrition is better and their overall health is better. Thank you. Thanks for all of your uh, responses to that question. Um, so um, I have another one that, that as uh, um, Courtney was talking about frailty, I was thinking about conversations that have come up before um, among researchers around talking to patients about frailty and using the F word. Um, and sometimes people are um, hesitant to, to tell people that they are frail or that they're on the path to becoming frail. And uh, I wonder if you have any experiences managing that language and thinking about talking to different types of people, different groups, um, and how you do that. Yeah, so that, that's an excellent point, Audrey. Um, so in this, in the sake of time, I didn't actually, so the, the, the frailty rehab with the CIHR funded frailty rehab study, um, I asked the research coordinator yesterday, Karen, to um, just send me a couple of slides on that. Um, and I didn't have a chance to, to include it in the context of this. I was just trying to find it here actually, but um, so in there she included, um, oh, here it is. Um, they've actually, they've, they've rebranded um, so she's got a slide here publicly now. So that's what the CHR title is, but it's now being publicly branded as optimal fitness, optimizing independence, mobility, and active life. So very timely question, 100% agree. I mean, I was talking about it as, you know, in terms of, it's still like that's the medical management of it, but absolutely um, thinking about it in terms of, you know, resilience and optimi optimizing, um, yeah, mobility. So yeah, hundred percent agree. Thank you. And so if there's a comment here, I'll read that and then I'll, I'll go to Eric for his question. Um, so um, Aiko says, last year I was given an opportunity to work with Hotel Victoria elderly clients. At the same time, I have seen seniors who are at risk of losing housing and or their housing situations are, are increasingly risky for their lives. The people in the community at risk of losing housing, many of them are reluctant to go to shelters and it becomes hidden homelessness or couch surfing. Those whose housing is increasingly risky, they are stuck in the hospital and the hospital does not know where to send them back to. There are not many options out there. Does anybody want to react to that? I can just say that it was great to have Ico working um, at, at Hotel Victoria. And um, yeah, we are still seeing people discharged to homelessness. And, um, and, you know, I think the Hotel Victoria and the work that we did with the MAP team was really critical and, and was an opportunity for us to demonstrate that this can save, you know, having a place to send people so that they get to work with people like ICO and housing workers and they're on the, on, you know, make sure that they have their ID in place. Um, all of those things are going to make their lives better and, and are they going to flush out the housing um, continuum as well and make sure that they're they're um, th that we build the housing that needs to be built to support the seniors that and and other people who are frail but you know it is some it is a model that we need to be replicating right now and and we need to stop discharging people to street homelessness or discharging people to the shelter system thanks david um Arif, you've been waiting patiently you have a question Hi everybody. I just wanted to make a comment about uh, about the presentation. I wanted to say that uh, uh, that David, uh, and Michelle, and the co team. Uh, I want to thank them very much for this um, uh, informative presentation and research. What I'm thinking is that this important information needs to be uh, to be available to all to all those who are making uh, policies and they're making decision making in terms of the of the seniors uh, and, and also the community uh, uh, the community centers who are working with seniors 
in order to help them in terms of identifying the long-term goals and short-term goals. This important information needs to be available, available to all those who are working for seniors. And I think that, uh, for example, uh, there is a, a website uh, for, uh, for the Hamilton City, and uh, there is also a, web, a page uh, for seniors. If this uh, presentation make available on this, uh, on this uh, websites, and also there are uh, a website uh, for embolding study, uh, I think that also it, if this uh, research and information make available there, it helps those who are making a programming and they think about helping uh, seniors uh, to, um, uh, uh, to think better and to plan better, better for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arab. And um, yeah, so uh, we, we agree. We think this is a really important question. I'm really happy to have everybody come together. Um, a couple of people have asked about a recording and yes so that this has been recorded and we will share that it will be on our website and i think we might ask casey to uh send this out to people after it's been cleaned up as well um so uh absolutely be able to revisit all of the points here um, so um I think can i maybe ask one question audrey if you course. have time yeah. yeah. And so thank you for the wonderful presentations. And I think there is such a, a great group of researchers and organizations advocating for housing for all our adults. But um, I was just curious to see what is the main obstacle? Is it getting attention from the policymakers? Is it getting funding from um, municipalities or from the province? Like, what is the number one barrier to move these things forward at the, at the moment? How you see it? from the different perspectives, maybe from the Dixon Hall perspective or from the academic perspective. I'm just curious to see what is the first, what is the actual hurdle that we should work hard as that to overcome? Uh, I think you, you, you hit on all of them. I mean, yes, it's getting the attention of, of um, you know, it's really difficult to build anything right now. The cost of, of building housing is is um, it's increasingly expensive. Um, you know, it it uh, baffles me really. I don't. There's no easy answer to that. I mean, why we are not supporting seniors and people who have long histories of homelessness, and we are why we're not prioritizing that population is is a bit beyond me. I, I don't have. There are there are no simple answers there. Um, I do think that. We need to be thinking about housing more as an ecosystem rather than, um, you, you know, thinking about just um, housing, you know, the homeless people and people who can afford single family dwellings. I, there, there's just so much to be thinking about and, and we need to be putting pressure on our on our governments. And, and I think it's particularly particularly salient um, as we move toward municipal government, uh, municipal elections in, in the coming months. Um, you know, I, I have yet to hear a Canadian politician say that um, they are they're determined to eradicate homelessness. I mean, we are hearing that in American cities. We're hearing that in in cities across um, Europe. Um, but I have yet to hear it from from the candidates um, running for mayoralty in Toronto. I don't know about Hamilton, but I, I, I would assume that I would have heard had they had they made that a priority. Well, I think Andrea Horvath is going to run for mayor in Hamilton, so hopefully oh. that will uh, be a in a going in a positive direction to Great. social um, action item. I hope so. I can build. Her. Oh, sorry. I can build a little bit upon what David said. I think it's 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 a really good question, and it's very complex, and it functions at many level levels. The multi jurisdictional nature of housing is an impediment. So the, the way that uh, the relations are set up, you know, in the constitution, the division of powers between the provinces and the feds, the municipalities don't necessarily have a seat at the table. So that needs to be restructured to be interjurisdictional um, amongst the three levels of government. As we know, municipal governments have been under crisis with COVID, the climate crisis, and all of these, and aging as well. And all these particular issues hit each level of government, right? And so there needs to be some change at the governmental level in terms of processes and structures. 
But in terms of the research and communicating with policymakers, there needs to be, quite frankly, more of this type of research. There's not a lot of people out there doing academic research that, at the intersections of housing, homelessness, and aging. And I'm only one person, and I, you know, and I'm an anthropologist, and I would love to work in larger teams and do more of that. And then it's also a question, as uh, Audrey mentioned earlier, of communicating these these uh, this research effectively. To, to policymakers. I think the will would be there if the structures were there to be able to make change. And I was just gonna, that's an excellent point. I, and one thing I was just gonna add to that is, um, I mean, I don't know as much about some of those things as David and Michelle for sure, but just sort of thinking, just pondering about this now um, in terms of like, like it's about dollars and cents if we can prove to people even with like continuity of care if people are keep going back to hospital and being admitted that that's that's expensive if we can be um you know improve bringing that to the table that we can save money like health system money i think that that could be a valuable chip to see that um you know and obviously i mean this is what our whole part but i mean in a, having the merging of these two systems but that it's all one and um you know that's, we, we are we do have the same payers in canada so i think maybe that could be that's just me pondering that now all comes down to money right yeah we have a question in the chat uh and this is from lawrence uh, he says that understanding hyper-local context is important to ensuring successful aging in the community. Are there housing models from other places you'd like to see adopted or piloted here in Ontario? Um, Scandinavia, I mean, there's, there's some really great um, work around housing um, for seniors and um, community responses to um, seniors housing in um, uh, Denmark, um, in in the in in Finland, as soon as you brush up against the the homeless serving sector, they guarantee you housing within three days. Um, that is unimaginable from the context of of Canada, where people sometimes are homeless for 10, 20 years. And um, so, I, I mean, I think that I think those are models that we can we we can begin to think about. And when you talk about hyper local, I am I see some really interesting work happening within the healthcare system. There was some, there's some work happening in Hamilton in the emergency rooms around discharging um, people. I think some of the work that we're doing with the MAP team is going to lead to that kind of work, um, particularly when we use the Hotel Victoria as a model for um, for new housing opportunities that that arise. I'm, I'm happy to hear if, if others have ideas. I think a lot of what Courtney talked about is like just making sure that people begin to speak differently about what access to the social determinants of health means and how it affects um, how people grow and age. And, and those are really important opportunities. I really love what Michelle's talking about too, the real opportunities for us to think about um, doing some work together to make sure that we're, we're, that the voices of the seniors are being heard and, and that we're, implementing effective responses to homelessness amongst the senior community. I totally agree with you, Michelle, about um, love the picture, like love the story. I'm a quantitative researcher by trade, and I love the quality. Like, we, we need that to speak to um, policymakers, healthcare professionals, donors. It, it, it's so um, such a key piece to that. So really love that too, the work that you presented on that. Um, Thank you, and a nice to see you, Lawrence, as well. Lawrence is an OCAD alum. And in terms of different models, yes, there are definitely others we can look to, and then we can tailor them to the context, depending upon the needs of the older adults. But one thing that comes to mind to me is how social housing is framed and thought of in, in different countries. So for example, in France, there isn't the stigma attached to social housing that we would have here. And social housing is available for certain occupations. So, so it's a wider breadth of people that are able to access social housing and it's done in terms of their income. So if one is a teacher or an artist, one can get a spot in social housing. So the buildings are really looked at differently. And when one has a different um, frame of mind of looking at social housing, you tend to build more of it. It's not that there aren't problems with access to social housing for structurally vulnerable groups in France. They're running it, bumping into that because it's conceptualized uh, differently in terms of more access. But if we look at different models, absolutely, we could uh, have some improvements here at home. Well, 
Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take the last moment here just to plug our next seminar and ask you to save the date. So the um, one topic, two discipline series has uh, about four of these talks a year. The next one will be on September 29th at noon. I'll just drop that in the chat.